Morning Storm. Today's episode is brought to you by Mary's Roadside Cafe at the corner of Route 3 and County Line Road. On Wednesdays, the patty melt is half price, and on Sundays, depending on how Mary and Ron do at the lake on Saturday, there's usually grilled trout, which they serve with roasted potatoes, the house salad, and sometimes butternut squash. Mary's Roadside Cafe. Good people, great food, and a killer view of the valley. Dr. Geller. Episode 8. Episode 8. Colonel Tor, do you have any factoids about number 8, or are we just kind of diving in? I will say this. In Hinduism, 8 is associated with wealth and abundance. Really? So maybe that's a good sign. Okay. I like the that. Goddess, the goddess of wealth and prosperity, uh, Lakshmi. Yes, you've mentioned has, her before. Yeah, she has 8 forms. What? So, what does that you mean? know, like, <laughs> um, she has 8, like, incarnations or whatever. But it's just part of the abundance that is then associated with wealth. Like, you know, she's so rich, like she's got to have a lot of, she's got to have eight incarnations to uh, explain all of her abundance. Right. Like one incarnation, not enough. Eight angels carry the throne of Allah, the prophet wow. in heaven, apparently. Wow. Eight of them. Okay. Four on each yeah. side. That makes sense. Sure. Balance. Sure. Well, or you two on each leg of the throne, maybe. I yeah, don't know. That makes Depends. even more sense. Yes. And eight people on Noah's Ark. Apparently. Are you serious? Yeah. Only eight people with all those animals? Yeah. I mean, the ratio doesn't the seem to make sense to. Yeah, but remember, it's a lot of animals, but wasn't it just like two of every type? True, but there's so, a lot so of types. So when you look at it yeah. that way, <laughs> it is a lot of types. So you would want like at least six of those eight humans definitely like shoveling up the. Yeah, I don't think you'd want to be outnumbered by the animals to that degree. Like, I think it should be more balanced. But hey, I am not an expert in those types of things. What I will say is I do want to at least acknowledge some of our listeners from very all around the world all yeah. around the world okay let's do it and again and and by the way fantastic uh factoids on eight um <laughs> i didn't you. know any of those things so let's say hello and again we have at least two typically more listeners in the places that i mentioned so first let's say hello to our good friends in mount juliet tennessee oh boy the south all right fantastic mount juliet want to say hello to our good friends in saskatoon saskatchewan okay that's canada that's Canada. They got a great junior hockey team up there, the Saskatoon Blades. Ooh. I know some people who've played for the Saskatoon uh, Blades. Great people up in Saskatchewan. Is there a town in Canada where there is not a good junior hockey team? I think that's good the point. question. Good point. Okay. Let's As, also... Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, no, no. It's better. It's better that I not go off on a uh, ice hockey jag. True enough, because we all we have a limited time for this uh Correct. sponsored episode. Let's also say hello to our good friends in Salerno, Italy. It's the province no. of Salerno. Yes. Get that. And, and I'm saying Heck more yeah, than one, me. right? So like at least two. Wow. And that's exciting. And may I add, uh, we have at least one listener. In Bolton Landing, New York, and I know because wow. we got an email from this listener, and this listener said, I guess we made a remark either in the last episode or the one before about how, you know, if we ever do a live tour, if we ever record our pod on the road, we get to stop in Peachtree Corners, Georgia. And apparently this listener said Bolton Landing would be a good stop for us. They Where said is it's that? right it's right on Lake George wow. in the in the Adirondack Mountains. Wow. Apparently they got a park right there on the lake, Rogers Park on the west side of the lake. They do live music there. Apparently it would be a perfect setup for us to uh, lay down an episode. So just keep that in mind. Bolton oh, Landing in mind. New York. That yeah. sounds beautiful. Fantastic. You know, you're presenting the biography today and we're always a little bit less likely to get in trouble when you're in charge. Well, that's only because I'm in control of the editing. Now, first of all, let me just say, do you remember the tease from last week? Well, you said you were going to break some rules again, and then I said that I liked it when you, you break the rules, because that was the Desperados episode. I felt like you broke the rules a little bit, so it's not just like one biography, but kind of a theme thing. Right. So here I go, breaking the rules yet again. Today, I'm going to be presenting two people as part of one killer biography episode. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a twofer. It sort of reminds me of um, if you go to Terry's Turpentine, yes. they, I know on Tuesdays you can That's get two right. home products for one. So, yeah, I couldn't be more excited. Uh, let's get to it. Two people for the price of one. Two people for the price of one. This episode today is going to focus on the subject of aviation, pilots in particular, Love just so it. you know. Now, my father-in-law happens to be a pilot, so I'm sure he will listen very attentively to this episode and most likely correct me on many misstatements that are sure to come. Kuntor, if I were to say to you, who was the first person to fly over the Atlantic without stopping? I'm sure I'm going to get it wrong, but I'm going to say Lindbergh. You're right. He was the first soloist to fly across the Atlantic from okay. New York to Paris, okay. uh, and he won the Ortigue Prize, $25,000 at Whoa. the time. Okay, that was the first solo flight across the Atlantic. That occurred in May of 1927. May 27. I'm that's, just setting the stage. Yeah, that's Lindbergh. Okay. That's Lindbergh, first to fly over the Atlantic by himself in an airplane, nonstop, 1927. Man. The Wright brothers, you know, they had their whole Kitty Hawk thing in 1903. Okay. Now, I want to talk about 1913. Okay, so that's so that's in between. That's only ten years after the Wright brothers. Okay, go ahead. Yes, and it's pre World War One. In 1913, Lord Northcliffe, who owned the London newspaper The Daily Mail, he offered a prize of ten thousand pounds, which in today's dollars would be about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. He offered this prize to quote the aviator who shall first cross the Atlantic in an aeroplane in flight from any point in the United States of America, Canada, or Newfoundland to any point in Great Britain or Ireland. That was his challenge. I mean, that's an incredible challenge. Ten, ten years after the Wright brothers, had, it, it sounds like a death wish. Fly across the ocean. Yeah. Okay, so that challenge, which, you know, captivated the interest of a lot of young people. And, kill, like, oh, and probably killed dozens of people. Many that we're not <laughs> going to talk about. So this challenge was suspended during the war. So from about 1914 to 1918. That would be tricky. I mean, all your best flyers are uh, in, in combat. Exactly. Now let's talk talk about our heroes of today's killer biography episode, Arthur Witten Brown and okay. John Alcock. Okay. Arthur Witten Brown and John Alcock. Now, these are the two guys. I'm already rooting for them. I, I hope they get the money. These are good guys. Okay. All right. So let's start with Arthur Witten Brown. He was known as Ted or Teddy. Okay. I don't, see how, first guy. don't see how we get to Teddy from Arthur Witten, but okay, go ahead. I don't know. He was born in Scotland in 1886. Interesting thing about Ted was that his parents were American. So he was technically American. Really? Although born in Scotland. Yes. What are they doing over there in Scotland? Good question. Yeah. His father worked for Westinghouse, oh. and he was there to evaluate where to put a factory. So he grew up in uh, England. They actually moved from Scotland to England when he was pretty young. Very good in math, as if he'd been born with a slide rule in his hand. Very mathematically inclined and Impressive. immediately started working as an engineer. I mean, that would be horrendous. I, a baby born with a slide rule in the hand would be very painful for the mother if it's a normal delivery. And obviously shocking for anyone in proximity to seeing this baby emerge with a slide rule because it raises all kinds of questions. Yeah, like... Wait, How'd you, how'd you get your hands on that? But it's not confirmed that he actually was born with a slide rule in his hand. It was just as if. No, yeah, exactly. I don't think there was uh, evidence to support an actual accusation that he was born with a slide rule in his hand. So very good in math, became an engineer right after school, and his co-workers described him as very intelligent. They said he was a, quote, jolly good fellow. Yeah, it sounds like a, it sounds like a retirement party or like you're leaving jobs. And they just they <laughs> sang that to him like on his last day is what that Right. Meant. Maybe there was some yeah, subtle message there. Like, yeah, yeah tell like, your fellow, why don't you go yeah, out the door? Take retire. your slide roll. Here, we'll sing you a song. Here's a cake. But he did develop a reputation as having a rock like character and a deep inner strength that stood out among his peers. He's gonna need it. It's gonna be brutal. It's coming. So he went to work for Westinghouse, like his father. They sent him to South Africa. He spent a couple years in South Africa. Africa, overseeing various engineering plants. And he came back as a general manager. When he came back is right around the time World War One. broke Wait, out. he came back to... So first of all, he was a Nepo baby, right? I mean, he got this gig because from his dad. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and he went out and proved himself down there on the assignment down in South Africa. 
And when you say he came back home from South Africa uh, to England or to America? Gotcha. Back to England. So he never lived in America. Gotcha. When World War I broke out, he enlisted in what was then known as the oh. University and Public Schools Brigade, which was basically a, a unit of, of the Royal Air Force. And in oh. order to join, he had to become a British citizen. So at that point, he did become a British citizen. Uh, you know, I don't hold it against him. They were on the uh, same side we were. So that's cool. He put a lot of thought into that decision. It, it wasn't something he did, you know, on a whim. Yeah. I mean, he spent his whole life in Scotland and England. I mean, it would be almost weird if he went and fought for the U.S. Okay. So there he goes. Ted Witten goes off to serve. He served in France and he joined the Squadron Royal Flying Corps as an observer. So he was more of the, you know, mathematician behind some of the flight patterns. Now, also at the time, incidentally, the Royal Air Force did not provide parachutes to their pilots. Now, can you fathom why they decided not to provide parachutes? Um, they didn't like the pilots? I don't think it was that they didn't like the pilots. They didn't like the idea of the pilots ditching their planes prematurely. Oh. So it was more part of their love for the planes. It was not their dis <laughs> distaste for the pilots. Yes, if it comes down to it. We don't want you bailing on our precious airplane a bit too early. Let's make sure you're going to be shot down. That's unbelievable. Because I, I, I could almost see it nowadays where planes like cost a billion dollars, combat, you know, fighter jets, where they'd be like, okay, we don't want to do anything to encourage these people to just pop out, you know, prematurely. Right. But back then, yeah, these were like kites, you know, it's sort of like, hey, no, I don't want to lose my kite. <laughs> you know, it's like th these were not billion dollar aircraft. Um, these were like tents. And in the also air. it's like, it, I mean, it couldn't be a more dangerous setup. It's like the whole field of aviation is just like 12 years old. So the planes probably aren't totally dialed in yet. And you're going into uh, combat. And right, like you're going to combat, you know, just a few years after the Bright Brothers got like eight <laughs> feet off the ground for 10 minutes, 10 seconds. Yeah. I mean, it's like, nobody was on. firing at the Wright Brothers on the beach. And and then on top of that, we're not giving you a parachute. Forget the parachute. We yeah. don't want you wasting our airplane. Anyways, Ted is up there and he, he he actually does get a pilot's license as well. But while he is um fighting in World War One, he gets oh. shot down over France, survives, and he goes back to England to recuperate. And as soon as he feels well enough, they send him back. How? Okay. Yeah. I mean, how do you survive a plane crash back then? Or is it like the, the planes aren't even going that high or that? fast and that's like right they're able to kind of land them in a ditch and so you just get damaged like i like i imagine a, a cute young you know french farm girl kind of comes and you know <laughs> like do you guys need some cheese and bread you guys while you're waiting for your your reinforcements some wine well, where's your dad is he doing the fields or something where like where are your parents <laughs> okay i do not like where <laughs> this is going so when he went back on duty after recuperating, he was shot down again. Are you kidding me? I'm and this is the kidding. dude who's going to try to fly all the way across the Atlantic Ocean? Well, just okay. wait. He ends up getting shot in the leg while he's in the airplane. So not only do they crash land, he had a very badly damaged leg from the bullet. In fact, that injury would follow him for the rest of his uh, life. Like he would use a walking stick and he could barely walk from that injury. Oh, man. Unfortunately, not only did he have this injury, but he was captured by the Germans and put into a prison camp. Wait, can you just can we just stop at this moment in the story and say this is the dude who potentially later is like at that moment where he's now been shot down a second time and badly injured in the leg and captured and put in a prison camp. Like this is the dude who later might win seven hundred fifty thousand bucks and uh, you know going across the ocean. This, this guy's incredible. So just listen. Okay. So he's in the prison camp and he's still obsessed. Like he was one of these kids that was infected by this daily mail contest, mm -hmm. like this challenge of navigating over the ocean in an mm -hmm. airplane. You know, that was his big thing. So one of his captors took a liking to him and allowed him to receive textbooks. So he was able to get some air and sea sort of navigation textbooks and also was able to look at some Royal Navy Marine charts while he was in prison. Yeah, it doesn't sound like these guards were really like top flight guards. Cause that I think it's like a Hogan's <laughs> Heroes, like they're kind of funny, but they're also like, come on, Ted. Yeah. Like you're a prisoner, no nightlight, <laughs> like, you know, but not the brutal, you know, the, these were the nice right. guards. Okay. Well, that's cool. So he gets he gets the textbooks. 
That's that's awesome. Yeah. No, in all seriousness, because he was like a captain or because of his elevated status within the military, he was given treatment that, you know, the normal guys probably didn't. Yeah. Get. But if I were if I were entitled to special treatment, I wouldn't be asking for textbooks. Let's just put it that way. You'd want, you know, extra More bread food. and some cookies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyways, he was known as uh, they say, quote, spent his every waking moment developing navigation techniques and procedures, customizing them to circumstances unique to over ocean air travel. Wow. So he had all these marine charts. He was uh, adjusting them for over ocean aerial navigation. Just obsessed. That's how he passed yeah. the time. And at the time, he noted that in flight celestial navigation uh, would be much harder than on like a slow moving ship. So he was using all these charts that were calculated on a slow moving ship. Uh, he knew it was going to be very different in a turbulent aerial crossing. Mm. So what he actually did while in captivity is he created his own modified spirit level, which was similar to like a carpenter's level with the bubble, like, you know, where you try to get things in the right. middle. Uh, he created his own version that he felt would work in an airplane. That's how obsessed he was. Yeah. I mean, and like I said, the whole field is so new. It's almost like the way we think now about space travel, you know, even more yeah. crazy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no one was thinking about. It. And I mean, keep in mind, he's in prison under terrible it conditions, and he's terrible. spending all of his time. He's eh, probably not that textbooks. Bad. Yeah, three hots in a cot plus textbook. Yeah. And he was able to create the spirit level, which is like, dude, where are you getting these tools? Yeah, he's like, wait, I've already did uh, AB calculus. Do you have the BC calculus book <laughs> anywhere? Could I? Can we send right. this one back? Anything online? What's a spirit this? level? Uh, so a spirit level is, as I said, sort of a modified carpenter's okay. level. So almost like a carpenter's level on steroids. Okay. And so that's cool. what he did. He ends up getting released and he returns to England in 1917, right before the war ends. So he's back and he's back and he's working in the Ministry of Munitions as an engineer. And he's he's paid his dues. Uh, he's he's He's, done it. he's already been shot down twice. He's been injured in war. By the way, yeah, the whole time he's doing these calculations in prison, his leg is throbbing. Like he said, that is just something he's going to live with the rest of his life. It's always in pain. Ooh. So after the war, he goes to work at the Ministry of Munitions. He meets one of his co-workers' daughters. And you tried to steer me away from the, the French farm girl fantasy, but now we're getting into the race, the racy stuff. Okay. Yeah. So he, he marries... He marries this woman. I was figuring maybe it would be two single guys uh, doing this uh, this death tr death wish trip across the Atlantic, but this guy's gonna do it with a with a wife and maybe doing some um, some rehab for the leg or something. I'm worried if it's still gonna be throbbing. It's still a yeah. problem. It's all it's a persistent issue for him. It's never anything he'll get hey, over. That's a cool um department name by the way, Ministry of Munitions. We uh, we should go back to that. That's that's cool. Yeah, it sounds legit. Yeah. Through his work as an engineer, he got to know people at Vickers. And Vickers is a large engineering Cough company drops. that at that time Cough what's drops? <laughs> no, that's oh, Vickers. Okay. Uh this is Vickers. Mm. Uh, so Vickers <laughs> is an engineering company that started manufacturing airplanes in those early teens. So yeah, so he was super excited. He, he, he decided to go to a meeting at Vickers one day uh, with some co-workers, and it was at Vickers that he met a young pilot oh boy. named John this, Alcock. This feels like a turning point in our narrative. This is definitely where we enter into the next phase of the story. He meets John. So Ted and John. He meets John. And, and John Alcock. So now let's focus on let's John Alcock. That. John Alcock was born on November 5th, which is my father's birthday. And in 1892 in Stratford. In is that a Scorpio? I'm October 26th. That's a Scorpio, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's a Scorpio. Yeah, okay. John was known as an outgoing man. He had kind of a ruddy complexion, mm -hmm. eldest of five children. Mm -hmm. He had a reputation among his siblings as being the best at making toffee and parkin and parkin is like a gingerbread uh with oats okay that so he's known as a good yeah cook. i mean it doesn't feel like a direct translation to the task at hand like getting across the atlantic but i mean they'll have some good toffee you know for the trip i guess yeah this is just adding color to the character gotcha. and will in the end have nothing to do with anything even better yes so john was mechanically inclined 
always working on engines, fiddling about, Mm -hmm. and developed a strong interest in flying from the time he was about 16 or 17. And that was around the time also that the Daily Mail Prize, or this flying across the Atlantic for this enormous cash prize, captivated the nation. So he was very excited about that challenge. I mean, I imagine that kids around the world were captivated just already by the news of the the Wright brothers and the earliest developments in aviation. There were kids around the world, I'm sure, who were obsessed. Obsessed. All over the world, there were teams everywhere looking to be the first to get across the Atlantic Ocean in an airplane. Insane. I, I, I'm going to be shocked if we get to the end of this story and there's nobody who died trying to do it, but go ahead. Well, let's not give anything away. So John Alcock uh, eventually gets a job as a mechanic at Brooklyn's Aerodrome, where there are all of these flights taking place, you know, testing out these airplanes. Uh, he did get his pilot's license in 1912 at the age of 20. Is this kid is this kid English or American? He's English. Okay. So he was born yeah, yeah in Stratford, right. England uh, right. to English parents. Okay. So John became a very very proficient pilot and became a racing pilot. So he was racing airplanes when he was about 20 years old um, in 1912. Very accomplished pilot. So when World War I broke out, he obviously joined the Royal Naval Air Service and, you know, quickly established himself as one of the top pilots. Wow. And one of the anecdotes that they tell about John is that one morning he was walking to the showers in his pajamas and enemy aircraft appeared overhead and he immediately ran to his plane. He got his, you know, co-workers to get the plane ready and took off in, in his, his pajamas. In his jammies. In his jammies. And then during this flight, uh, oil tended petrol and oil mixed together and it was leaking and would fly up and hit his goggles. Jeez. And so he could barely see. And so his pajama sleeve was used to clear his goggles. Man, this is like a mo- this is like a movie, you know? Okay. So he shoots down two enemy airplanes. Wow. And he lands after this crazy mission. And apparently they said he got out of his plane and walked back to the shower. <laughs> so it was for him just a routine situation yeah like the rest of us are feeling good if we like get a workout in before breakfast but like he downed two enemy planes before breakfast <laughs> before shower before showering. and for that specific incident he was awarded the distinguished service cross for bravery and ability i feel i feel like that's merited he he earned that and maybe and maybe maybe his uh you know his his uh fellow uh members of his you know whatever battalion brigade whatever you call it uh maybe he could just chip in and you know get him some new pajamas or something because it sounds like the oil probably stained those you know or at least expedite washing like get someone to really scrub them out because i don't know in the field if they have new pajamas i don't know i imagine that wasn't like super refined oil or gas back then those are some tough stains to get out and Brutal. um so i'm gonna say just get, get the guy a new pair of jammies you know yeah someone give up a pair so here's what's crazy so he gets back from that mission everyone's just astounded yeah. because of what he was able to accomplish later that very same night he went on a bombing mission and he had to turn back because one of his engines failed after being shot oh my god so he's flying back with one engine and then the second engine fails and he has to ditch the plane in the sea uh, off the coast of Gallipoli. And he's like, so he you has know to what? do like a sea landing. Yeah, and he's like, but that's no problem because I got a parachute. Oh, oh, wait a minute. No parachute. <laughs> okay. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. So he is able to ditch this plane and they survive. I can't believe people are surviving the plane wrecks back then. Unbelievable. And then they had to swim for an hour. They reached the shore. Wait, this is this. Wait, this is the same night that after he woke up in the morning yes. and down. Oh, my yes. Lord. It's the same day. It's that night. He swims for an hour. They get to the Ottoman army held shore and are immediately taken prisoner yeah. uh, by Turkish forces. So he gets taken into a prisoner camp. The conditions are supposedly horrible. Yeah. But the the people that were with him said he always seemed optimistic on the outside. And that as a leader, because he was, because he was known as a fighter ace, that yeah. he felt it was his duty to project this air of confidence. Makes sense. Um, I got to say that day of his, that epic day of his, that um, 
started, you know, was shooting the planes down before the show, that uh, day must have felt like a whole week to him. Like when he got to the end of that whole episode and was like, you know, getting checked in at the, the Turkish prison, he, he must have been like, dude, was that really just a day that like right. felt like that was a When did I shower? Did I get pajamas? <laughs> Where are those pajamas? So while he was in captivity, he dreamt about that Atlantic flight, you know, as a pilot, like he just knew that's what he wanted to do. So he was in the prison camp for two years. And it doesn't and it doesn't sound like at this prison camp you're getting like the textbooks and like the special treatment. Zero and textbooks. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's staring at the wall and thinking about flying across the Atlantic. Yeah. I wonder how many I wonder how many guys it, you know, it strikes me that that um contest, that challenge probably lodged in the brains of many, many uh young men who during World War One are like, yeah, I wanna get out of this war, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna earn all this cash. Exactly. And in fact, like I think one of the rules was that you could not be active military. So you had to like, you know, retire from the military. Yeah. I mean, the, the active, the no active military thing is not a problem. I mean, like if I, right. if I survive a prison camp, it's not like I'm looking to re yeah, I'm out of that. Once I get, right. yeah. 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 I'm out. So John is out. So he gets back to England after the armistice and retires from the Royal Air Force or Royal Air Navy in March of 1919. Okay. And after that, he becomes a test pilot for Vickers, which is where he meets Ted because he's at Vickers uh, working as a test pilot. Fantastic. Now, lots of teams and companies trying to make this attempt at the crossing. So it's not like it's just these two guys. And so when Ted and, and John met, on this day, they immediately started talking about crossing the Atlantic. And what John recognized was that Ted had a superior knowledge of aerial navigation. Hmm. You know, he wasn't an expert pilot, but he had clearly advanced in this uh, discipline of aerial navigation, which yeah, barely existed. Up, yeah, he came up with his own spirit level. He, uh, you know, he, he not only came up with his own spirit level. Yeah, he's got the textbooks. He modified a sextant and use that to show John how he would do his calculations to determine, you know, latitude and longitude. Okay. So a perfect. sextant so- is like an instrument for determining the angle, and I'm reading the definition here, the angle between the horizon and a celestial body, such as the sun, the moon, or a star, typically used in celestial navigation to determine latitude and longitude. So Ted had taken this sextant instrument, which had typically been used on ships, and modified it so that he would be able to use it in an airplane. Perfect navigation guy. He's going to be the navigation guy. He's the navigator. And and so all the stuff that we think of nowadays, all the instruments in uh, planes, they don't they don't have that stuff. Yeah, they're doing no. That and old in fact, school. when when you when you think about like walking across a desert or flying across the Atlantic Ocean mm-hmm. and all the winds, like how do you know if you're going in the right direction? Like it, it's, it's a huge issue. Yeah. Um, back then, because you're basically flying like a go kart across the Atlantic. You know, it's not like you have sophisticated aerial navigation instruments i mean you've got a nice uh, batch of homemade toffee so there's that that, and that's cool so you know that's cool i don't know if he's still making toffee you got to. i feel like you got it and you break that out mid-flight like hey i never told you this but guess who makes the best toffee this side of Gloucesterburg? Yeah, I think you wait until I think you wait until Ted is like feeling down about something, like maybe he screwed up a calculation or the flight's not going, and you need to pick him up. You know, you're like, hey, you start peeling the the tin foil off the top of that toffee, and yeah, you know what I mean? So psyched! You're so psyched! Yeah, even if it's parking. You know, I'm not a big gingerbread guy, but like with oats or whatever, you're starving, you know? Yeah. Maybe bring them both. You know, Toffee know, and no bargain. reason not to. Yeah. Okay. So when Alcock and Ted got to talking, uh, Alcock knew that Ted was the guy for the role of navigator. Yeah. But expressed serious concern about his physical ability. Well, because the, the bad leg. The bad leg. And yeah. he knew the flight's you know, it's a rough and tumble flight. You got to yeah. get up. You got to like, you know, help. So he was really nervous about that. Hmm. But he was so impressed with his navigation skills, he knew he was the right guy. So they agree to partner 
and attempt to fly across the Atlantic together. What what year is this that these two guys meet up at Vickers? This is 1919, just right after World War One. They decide to partner together, and Vimy is the airplane they settle on using, which is Vickers aircraft. So the Vickers Vimy, and it was modified to add more fuel tanks. I bet. And they also had an experimental wireless communication system that they put on the airplane. If you picture the Wright brothers biplane, like you know, it kind of looks like a you know a model plane like it, it's like toothpicks and you know whatever yeah this is not much different so it's not like they're in some sophisticated aircraft like this is a very basic oh, looking structure. oh interesting okay so because that doesn't feel like something that'll get across the atlantic but they pack it with all these extra fuel tanks and they have these two big engines and it's basically like two big engines with like this little bathtub in the middle it's like it's open air so it's so there's no um interesting i have a million questions like what altitude do you fly at when you're going across? The you fly as as high as maybe a few thousand feet above, but you also fly as low as fifty feet. It's, oh, it's like it's it's really I would crazy. Be just scared to death at fifty feet above the ocean. Yeah. So John is concerned about this wireless communication system because he feels like it's just adding all this weight and it keeps uh, failing, and he's just not excited about it. But Ted is insistent about having this wireless communication system. They can talk to each other in air. And they can communicate through the Marconi invention uh, wirelessly with people in Newfoundland and potentially in Ireland. Amazing. Which was pretty good. They get this airplane and the instrument panel that they'll be using is very primitive, obviously. So it has an altimeter. So it tells you how far above sea level you are, how high above sea level you are. It has a tachometer so that you knew the RPMs of the engine, uh, an airspeed indicator, and then everything else was kind of up to them. They, they had mm. a precision watch and a compass, and they had Ted's modified sextant, and they just had to be super careful about switching over to the right petrol tanks at the right time. Oh, boy. They did a couple test flights with this plane in England and decided, okay, this is our plane. They then had to sail for Nova Scotia because they had planned to take off from St. John which is in southwestern Newfoundland, the closest point in North America to Ireland. For a minute. So they sail to Nova Scotia and their crew or the people that are working on this endeavor with them at Vickers stay behind to dismantle the plane and get it ready to ship to Halifax, Nova Scotia. So this is an arduous process. You know, this is not just like, let's hop in the plane, fly across, we're all good. Well, I and I'm, I'm nervous about dismantling, dismantling the whole plane before you ship it over there because like I, I'd be paranoid like okay guys let's you know make sure you put it back together correctly right you have all the bolts like you've done those you know couches from Kia throw in like an extra bolt in each little pack but again this is sort of like a tent like it's more just like let's roll it up put the sticks in a bag and let's ship this puppy to Nova Scotia yeah this is a disaster okay so John and Ted sail to Nova Scotia now once they get to Nova Scotia um, which was on May 9th of 1919. They then had to travel a thousand miles to St. John's, which is in southwestern Newfoundland. We know exactly where it is. It uh, was just in the news. I think that's where the, uh, that was like a contact point when they were doing the rescue efforts for that submersible that got lost exactly right. going on the Titanic. Yeah. So St. John's is uh, also another, uh, another uh, notable junior hockey location, by the way. Really? Yeah. But um, here's my theory. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's very remote. That uh, I'd love to go to St. John's. It, it, you'd want to you'd you'd want to go in the summer, and yes. um, you'd want to go in a plane that's a more modern, you know, airplane. Not that not the For type sure. that you dismantle and it's got like a bathtub that you sit in. Um, no, okay, you don't want that. Okay. So they do this arduous journey and they get to St. John's. They settle into sort of a hotel. There are other flying teams there. So there are a lot of people that are competing to get this plane across the Atlantic. Oh, man. And they're a little bit late. Yeah, that's stressful. Super stressful. But, they're you know, it's sort of like friendly, but also like, how's your plane doing? And unfortunately, they can't find a place to assemble their plane and form a runway. Like this is sort of the middle of nowhere. Oh. And so they had to buy a car. They're driving around together, trying to find a place to put their plane. They 
finally find a spot and convince the owner to clear the pasture, which required literally dynamiting boulders and then using horse-drawn graders to at least get the field to a level that they could roll an airplane down. Okay, that that's what they're doing. That's what these two guys are doing. Insane. I mean, can't they just use a road? Dude, this is 1919 in St. John's. Yeah. There are no roads. Okay. This is super remote. So, but this is what the pilot and the engineer uh, navigator are doing. They're like trying to find a place to take off. What what are all the what are all the other teams doing for their takeoff spot? They found places because they were there earlier, oh, so they were able to so find sweet. some fields. So stressful. So these guys had to, yeah. So they finally find this place. They send for the Vimy, and the Vimy arrives. You know, like a month later. So they're literally just waiting for a month and trying to find the place and driving around. Are they the first ones to take off in this challenge? No. No, oh. other planes have tried. Uh, some Navy planes have sort of landed on the water and then taken off again after being refueled by ships nearby. But no one has attempted the uh, cross-Atlantic flight. Wait, because uh, because the rules of the challenge are you can't um, you can't go down to the water and refuel or anything like that. Right, it has to be nonstop. Okay, so the, the, the that's the challenge. Okay, uh, and no one has been able to accomplish that. The plane arrives in all these pieces, you know, on a horse-drawn carriage. And Alcock oversees the assembly of the plane and Teddy is working on his navigation and all the different charts and testing out the wireless. Do you think he's still walking around with a uh, cane, like with a walking Tremendous stick? Tremendous pain in his leg. He references that many times. Do you think yeah. John's like looking over there like, Ugh, I don't know, man. This guy can barely get from that side of the hangar to this side of the hangar. I'm it's like, amazing. On the ship ride over, uh, they became super close and developed a, a, a really strong attachment to each other because of this feat that they were about to attempt. That was their focus. John had great respect for Ted. Ted had great respect for John. Okay. All right. So before we get to the flight, because I'm going to skip ahead and get right to the flight because they're ready to go. The plane has been assembled. Yeah. The uh, pasture is acceptable. I would not say great. And they're itching to go because they want to be the first. Before we get to the flight, let's hear from our sponsor, Mary's, and then we'll hear about the transatlantic flight attempt of John Alcock and Ted Witten. All right. Let's pay the bills. For a great meal at an affordable price, try Mary's Roadside Cafe on Route 3 at County Line Road. Summer specials include grilled trout, patty melts, and a really nice vegan chili. Mary's Roadside Cafe. Good people, great food, and a killer view of the valley. So we left off just before they're going to make this attempt at a nonstop flight across the Atlantic. Before we forget, I think Mary's, maybe they ought to add a toffee option on their dessert menu. A great tie-in. You know yeah. what I'm saying? The transatlantic toffee. Great idea. I may, you know, Lizzie, if you're listening, it would be a good idea to email Mary about yeah. that idea. Let's get to the flight. They're ready to go. I mean, this thing is assembled. They've they've dynamited the boulders out of the field. Here we go. Let's get this puppy in the air. So John wants to leave on Friday, June thirteenth. Oh, Friday the thirteenth. What? The That's heck? his lucky number. No, and he loves it. He That's loves thirteen. Dumb. No, That's he wants asking to asking for trouble. Well, as it turns out, it didn't matter because the weather did not cooperate. Okay, good. So they were unable to leave. Let me just say that the cockpit where they were both sitting, and this was bench seating, very cramped. Sitting shoulder to shoulder, oh. you know, open air, provisions stashed wherever they could, mm -hmm. stiff wires connecting the rudder bar to the twin rudders. I had to be kept clear of obstruction. Cables and exposed rudder pulleys made oh, it very God. dangerous with their feet and legs the if they were get tangled. So stiff wires. This sounds like a duct tape uh, operation. This is scaring me. This is where they're sitting to cross the Atlantic. And and they're and they're side by side, huh? I was picturing the old uh, the nav guy is uh, in in back, you know, like no. shouting over the shoulder, shoulder to shoulder, hmm. sitting on this little bench. They did bring two stuffed animal black cat mascots for the flight. Wait, these guys are begging for disaster. So John had Lucky Jim and uh, Brown had Twinkle Toes. Hmm. And they they carried them. They also had a horseshoe screwed underneath the pilot's seat. So a little bit of superstition. Well, the horseshoe, yeah. But I mean, black cats and, and wanting to leave on Friday the 13th. Yeah. If I'm Ted, I'm starting to wonder like, okay, is, is my buddy here got a freaking <laughs> death wish? Yeah. 
they're ready to go though. And Brown, uh, Ted Brown, right before they were to take off, when they're literally storing all their like you know provisions themselves, like yeah, in this, the cockpit, yeah, like the stuffed animals, the toffee, right, stuffed animals, the horseshoe. Uh, Brown reported that Lucky Jim, which was Alcock's stuffed animal wore, quote, a hopeful expression, whereas Twinkletoes expressed surprise and anxiety. Oh, uh, that's what God. Ted said. You got to love this Ted guy. I mean, that's pretty I, cool. Like, he's saying that right before he's about to risk his life crossing the Atlantic. I guess. I don't know. I'd be like, if he said that to me, if I were John and Ted was like, oh, it seems like, you know, Twinkletoes, I'd be like, dude, get your head in the game. Like, let's focus <laughs> on the navigation. Like, I, they look the exact same as they've looked for the last two years. Like, they're stuffed yeah, I animals. I see you packed your stuffed animals. Did you bring the sextant? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, let's get serious. Here. Yeah. I'm less interested in your spirit animal than the spirit level that you said that you made. <laughs> exactly. All right. Uh, that, so they also brought uh, the very first bag of air mail. So this was sort of going to be proof that they cool. were able to bring this mail across the Atlantic. Nice. Uh, never been done before. Junk mail? I imagine it's like catalogs and stuff. Yeah, because it's, you know, Northwest. It's probably L.L. Bean, yeah. I'm guessing. It was yeah. like, you know, but appropriate because, you know, you want tough wear on this flight. Um, so they're finally ready to take off. It's about 1.45 p.m. Saturday, June 14th, 1919. They have this overloaded plane. They barely make it down this very rough ground. Uh, they start clipping trees oh, as the plane takes no. off. But they do gain just enough altitude to get going. And literally all the people watching on the ground assumed it was going to crash. Like they expected yeah. to run up and see the plane crashed like 50 feet beyond where they could see. Well, especially if they're taking off branches on their way at the very beginning. It's like you know that they're all like cheering and saying like, you know, good luck, whatever. And as soon as it gets into the air, they're like, yeah, I bet they get like maybe 50 miles. Because a couple weeks earlier, one of the planes that attempted did crash. Now, the pilots survived. The navigator and the pilot survived, but the plane crashed. So there was an attempt made that had failed. Maybe we need to go back to these. It sounds like a lot of people surviving plane crashes back then. Maybe we should I go know. back to the, sort old, of the, theme of the old airplanes. Yeah. Oh, good point. So they make it off the ground. And, you know, like all flying machines at that time, and it's it's generous to call them machines, because when you see this thing, you're like, what? Uh, they're very unstable. So if you were to take your hands off of essentially the steering wheel for even a couple seconds, you'd immediately lose control of the entire plane. Oh, man. So you really can't take your hands off. It's very challenging physically to fly these planes because you're really doing everything you know physically ain't got no autopilot back then there is no autopilot is there is there any plan for um can they take turns on the controls or is it does that one dude have to hold the controls for it's going to be john alcock the entire way oh my um, god with ted focused on the navigation and they even reference the fact that john for the first two hours like realized he was holding the steering wheel too tightly like he was hurting his hands. Like he's so. And that's you know, two nervous. hours in. Only two hours. I guess you just go ahead and pee your pants because there's no. Nope. Like... They did have a bottle system that they would then toss overboard. Oh, um, but okay. that's not a focus of this that's pod. Littering. But yeah, they did have those things figured out. It's technically yeah. littering, but okay. Technically true. They were also drinking on board. They brought Guinness Stout and they did uh, imbibe. Okay. That doesn't seem like a great idea. Like a lot of Guinness Stout. Because if you remember going back to the Killer Shipwreck episode about the um Va was it the Vasa or the one Vasa. of those ships yeah. where, where the guys were like allowed quite a bit of alcohol per sailor. Yeah. yeah. I would want to limit it when it's just two guys on a brand new technology like an aircraft. I'd say like, yeah, we can do a ceremonial like you each get a pint, but I would I think it was more of that. Okay. Yeah, I don't think they it wasn't like, you know, like a twelve pack. You know, I think like, it was just I like, wonder if one of them was just like an all day drinker. Like yeah, <laughs> he's a great navigator. He's also just a functional alcohol. Yeah, you got those sandwiches? Yeah. What about beer? Beer. We're flying across the Atlantic. Yeah, no, I mean, just whatever. Whatever yeah. we have to drink. Do you have the beer? Yeah, we're flying across the Atlantic, which is crazy. There's no way I'm going to do it sober. So let's just hit, <laughs> hit the Guinness right off the bat. So Brown had also studied the ocean surface and, and had this instrument called a drift indicator that he used to measure sort of you know, the, the, the waves and, and could calculate speed and direction of air currents. 
because uh, he was very nervous about being pushed off course. Mm -hmm. And so he was able to roughly calculate the speed of the aircraft and plot a course to take them to this area in Ireland uh, where they needed to get to. That's what they're aiming for, huh? So from they're St. John, so, so from Newfoundland to Ireland is the goal. That's the goal. I wonder if uh, some of these things that our navigator, um, you know, developed for the some of these special tools, whether they actually worked on the uh, trip. Well, it, it's a great question. And uh, the answer is yes and no. So not an easy flight, uh, as mentioned, very turbulent the entire way. Like there, there's no avoiding severe turbulence over the North Atlantic in essentially a kite. Uh, yeah. Now, on top of that, Teddy is doing complex math uh, on his lap, you know, taking measurements with this sextant compass like device uh, in an open air cockpit um, in heavy turbulence with, you know, his life on the line. He's doing complex calculations. Unbelievable. I fly economy plus you know yeah because you get like the extra leg room and then extra leg room but doing homework on a plane's hard yeah now um these guys i mean if you've already been shot down twice in uh a war and survived though it's like on the one hand this sounds like a, a really suicidal mission on the other hand it's like okay at least nobody's shooting at us like a couple of years ago people were trying to shoot our plane out of the sky right and one is like 25, one's 29. Like they're pretty young. They're sort of excited to they, they, accomplish they have, this. Do they crazy have thing. kids yet or no? No, neither of them have kids, although Ted is married. Yeah, but it's probably, but better, not, that, it's probably better that they don't have kids at this point. Right. So a couple hours into the flight, the wind-driven electrical, gener electrical generator fails oh. um, and, and sort of like pops off the plane. So they <laughs> immediately lose radio contact, pops uh, their off. intercom system. Yeah. <laughs> It literally like just snaps off. You're like, what, okay, that, what, what was, was the that? generator? Was that the bottle? Was that the bottle of urine that I? No, no, that was That's the, the generator. <laughs> and, and it's of kind of funny be <laughs> because John had this thing against this radio thing the whole time. Yeah, and Ted was insistent on them taking it, and then of course it breaks immediately. Yeah. And they do describe like that. I'm not going to look at John right now because yeah. I know what he's going to say. I wonder then, do they just throw the rest of that system overboard to say? Well, they did get rid of their headset. So they lost not only radio contact, but their intercom so mm. that they could speak to each other and the, the heating. Okay, well, they're uh, sitting suit. shoulder to shoulder. I mean, do we yeah, really but it's need so intercom? it's so loud. It's so loud. It's so loud. Okay. And the wind, you know, this is open air. They're going yeah. like 100 miles an hour. So their heating oh system God. fails. Is that what it is? It's suits. 100 miles an hour? Yeah. What's a, what's a, what's a, uh, if I'm flying to New York nowadays, what, how fast am I going? Probably six, 600 miles an hour, probably 500 miles an hour, you know, at least 500 miles an hour. I would oh guess. my Lord, a hundred, you know, miles 300 at the lowest, but they're barely, you know, they're probably averaging 80 miles an hour, but they, they do reach a hundred miles an hour. Uh, so anyway, so they're, but it's freezing cause they, they don't have their heating system anymore. Um, anyways, to make matters worse, very soon after they lose their uh, electrical generator, an exhaust pipe bursts on one of the engines, which creates an incredibly frightening noise that persisted the rest of the flight. Uh. And so they describe it as making any conversation completely impossible. No. And they lose part of their hearing almost immediately. And that persists for one of them, I think, the rest of their life. They, they have big hearing problems because one of the oh. engines blows uh, this exhaust pipe. Oh and that's only God. after a couple hours into Can flight. you imagine? I mean, all the other stress, you know, it's like each one of these things that goes wrong, it's like just when you think you couldn't get any more tense, it's like yes. now there's this noise that sounds like we're going to crash any second. Any second. So the bad weather. But the engine, continues. but the engine keeps working, though. It keeps working. Okay. It keeps working and they make do. But it wouldn't, they wouldn't like pass a smog check at this point. It probably wouldn't pass any check <laughs> of any kind. Um, but yet it, they, they stay aloft. So the Vimy continues to fly. It flies into a bank of fog so thick they could not see their wings. Oh, no. Now, this was serious because Brown obviously <laughs> could not navigate <laughs> this at all. It was serious because it's like, yeah, I know that's serious. I mean, right. that, that's, yeah. A blind flying. <laughs> and, you know, that does not sound right. No. Right? no. Um, oh. And they say blind flying should only be undertaken with gyroscopic instruments. And they didn't have those. They, so that's not good. They didn't have those, huh? No. And this situation they were in caused men to lose their sense of balance. 
And so Alcock could not keep the aircraft flat using the controls. So, well, I thought you were going to say lose control of bodily functions because that would have been I'm one sure of that the first things, as well. things that happened yeah, for and, me. And, and, and to set this tone, like, you know, these guys are wearing like suits and then a flight suit over their suits. But like they actually put on a tie. For this flight, no, you know, I question when I'm in Southwest, insane. are you allowed to wear shorts? Like these guys yeah. are wearing a tie, and it and it's a nice uh, tie-in to what we described at the beginning, which is like this guy's able to fly in jammies. This is ja- this is Jammy John, and he's all gussied up for this. He's got his his suit on. Just seems like suit, really the Guinness. wrong. I mean, it seems like the wrong gear. I mean, totally as long wrong. as you're leaving from St. John's, like get some heavy flannel, some wool. It's cold up there, yeah. you know? Freezing, especially when you lose your generator. Yeah. So John attempts to pull the nose up, but he doesn't have reliable instruments and there's no visible horizon. Um, and so the Vimy climbed too steeply and it stalled. Ah! Uh! And it begins no. to fall in a steep no. spinning dive over the Atlantic. Oh. And they're unable to tell which direction My. they're going or where they're spinning. God. Alcock is trying to regain control of the aircraft, and they suddenly emerge from clouds about 100 feet above the Atlantic. And he's able to pull the plane back and get it back aloft. Um, so he's able to change oh. angles just as they came out of the fog. And... They literally were 50 feet above the waves. And Ted describes feeling the ocean spray on his face. Yeah, that wouldn't have been the only spray. I would have thrown up all over my partner on that flight. I would have been like, yeah. you know, turned to talk to him and just like projectile vomited right into his goggles. Do they have the goggles or no goggles? They had stopped using the goggles mm. because they kept getting fogged over and they couldn't take it anymore. Right. So they're both goggleless. Buddy. Okay. So at 12. Also, imagine yeah. if you're Ted when you get into the thick bank of fog and it's like your whole thing is like, I'm the navigation guy. And it's like, okay, I can't do it. I got nothing. <laughs> I got zero. Like, well, can you try your no, no, I got nothing. Nah. No, are you? Are these wings? I can't see the wings. Well, they don't seem straight. So at twelve fifteen a.m., they broke through the fog, and Brown was able to get a glimpse of the stars. So he immediately used his sextant and determined that they were still on course. Wow! Even after the stalling and the spiraling, and the because you'd think you'd come out of that, and maybe you're actually facing back toward st john's or something he relied on his compass and his calculations and somehow they ended up on course wow now they did experience a broken trim control that made the plane feel very nose heavy uh as the fuel was consumed so that was just another issue that john alcock who again very physically demanding flight had to contend with uh as they crossed the atlantic yeah Trim can be dangerous. So now it's three o'clock in the morning and they enter into a large snowstorm and it's snow and freezing rain. So the instruments are icing up um, and it's becoming somewhat unflyable. Ted has to like stand up and scrape, you know, some of the ice off, leg killing him. It's a terrible situation. How many hours roughly are we into this flight at this point? About 10 hours in at this point. 10 or 11. Um, And it's June, but they got some snow over the North Atlantic, huh? North Atlantic. Yeah. Snowstorm. Uh, Stuffed animals covered in ice. Ted makes a note of that. Boy. Uh, (laughs) Carburetors ice up. Did Ted make any comment about, you know, what their expressions were at this point? (laughs) <laughs> he didn't. He just said that they looked like they Both were completely cat, covered in ice. Look, <laughs> totally terrified at this point. Yes. So he, despite his throbbing leg, had to scrape the sleet off of the control faces and get mm-hmm. some of the ice off the wings. Um, oh, because it was really no. Bad. Get the ice yeah. off the wings? Yes. How is he going to do so that? He's scraping anything that he can reach. And it's debatable how far across he, he went, but he did have to get up out of his seat. John was very nervous about it. Oh, my God. I would be like, don't touch the wings, dude. Like, yeah. No, they're they're desperate at this point. Ice is, is starting to accumulate. So the fog over the North Atlantic <sighs> is horrible. And for several hours... They really could not see anything. I, I forget. Were the terms of the challenge, did you have to leave from America or were you allowed to leave from like South America and go over? Like it had to be um, America to it Europe? It had to be, yeah. United States, Canada or Newfoundland or you know, Nova okay. Scotia. <sighs> Okay. So Ted is relying on what's known as dead reckoning, which is Doesn't where they start good. with a known position. No, it has an ominous uh, name. Uh, you start with a known position 
And then you advance that position mathematically based on whatever you can record uh, related to, you know, sort of your heading, your speed, your time. It, it, it's, a, it's a crap shoot, put yeah. it that way. Rudimentary. Yes. So they keep going. They're trying to stay positive at 8.15 a.m. Okay, so this is, you know, 15 hours or so after they left. They spot the Irish coast. They see the Irish coast. Yes. And they describe the feeling of, although they're both in pain, like physical pain, yeah. uh, they just whooped and hollered and slapped each other on the back. Okay, well, let's not count our chickens. H- how far away is the coast? Well, it's it's close. And, and you know, along the way, Brown was only able to log four celestial observations. So he only had those four chances and still hit his destination on the head. That's how good he was as a navigator. Wow. So he earned his half of the cut. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. So they finally make landfall in County Galway at 8.40 a.m. on the next day, on June 15th. Not far from their intended landing place. They found a great uh, pasture for flying, uh, for landing. Yeah. However, it turned out to be a bog. And so they ended up uh, crashing. And the aircraft went nose over. Uh, fortunately, they were not hurt. But it, these guys Ted actually did sustain many, like a pretty bad bump on the nose, like he was in bad shape. Yeah. How many planes are these guys going to uh, wreck? Third. I mean, that's his yeah. third. He's already got a bad leg. Now he's yeah. now he's got a face a facial injury. But they said had the weather been better, they felt like they could have made it all the way to London. And they they had yeah. the airmail. You gotta you you gotta just as soon as you get to land, you gotta put it down because it's like why let let's because you, you know you 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 get fancy and you get cocky and you're like hey screw it let's go all the way to London and some other dude who was on your tail lands on the Irish coast (laughs) while you're like trying to get to London, you know, (laughs) great point. Uh, So, so good for them. They, they stayed in, uh, in County Galway in Ireland, everyone in town, super excited. I imagine they stayed in the bog. I mean, it's probably hard to get them out. It did take a while to get them out. And then all these townspeople descended on them. They became huge stars around the world. Worldwide. Yeah. They just flew across the. I mean, yeah. that's insane. Nowadays, it's just something that it still feels all these years later. It's there's something on a primal level where you're like, we're flying over this vast ocean. Like, that's incredible. And imagine being and the first, first ones to do it. To it's do never it. been done. Yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah, huge stars. Uh, the Secretary of State for War and Error presented them with the Daily Mail Prize because Lord Northcliffe was too ill. Um, guess who the Secretary of State uh, for War and Air was at the time? Churchill? It was Winston Churchill. Yeah. I and knew I it. asked because I knew you would know that. Um, uh, Northcliffe, do you think he he took um, sick leave because he was like, oh, my God, I'm actually going to have to pay out on this thing. <laughs> he it was sucked. so excited for them. He wrote them like an incredible letter. Like he was very old. He died like a few months later. When they collected their prize, they allocated like a quarter of it to be distributed to the people in St. John's who had helped them for the month that they were there. Oh, wow. Um, which was pretty cool. Very cool. I thought it was going to be to veterans of the First World War, but I guess they liked- No, I think the rest was just, you know, like alcohol. Like they spent, they had through big parties. Yeah. But they did send the guys at, at St. John's uh, a big uh, donation. They were huge heroes. Uh, a few days after they landed, they were invited to Windsor Castle, and both men were knighted by King George V. No, they were not. And they spent time with him. Apparently, he was incredibly interested in their flight. Dude, a day ago, they were like clipping trees and trying to get yes. off the runway in St. John. Now they're being knighted in Windsor Castle. Knighted. Like they, they're, this is and they're not only they not only won the prize, they, you know, other prizes, like they were enormous celebrities at this point. However, that's not the type of people they were. So Alcock went back to flying for Vickers. Okay. Really? I and would... even though they planned to do another adventure together, they were like, we're going to do another feat. Like we're going to fly somewhere. I would never step in a plane again. If I survived that thing, I'd be like, okay, you know, I've tempted God enough. Now let's. That is not Alcock. No. So John went back to flying for Vickers uh, mm-hmm. as a test pilot. And only a few months later, 
um, at age 27 uh, in December, he crashed one of the new Vickers Viking amphibians that he was flying to a Paris air show. And he was and fired? Died. Oh. No, he was, he, he was killed. So they didn't have to fire him because he died. Right. Um, but they didn't have a need to fire him until he crashed the plane. And then he was already dead. He died only, uh, uh, you know, a, a few months after flying across at the Atlantic. 27. Yeah, in a plane crash right after crossing the Atlantic. Oh, my Lord. That's exactly what I was saying. I would never step and get in a plane again. So sad. So um, sad. Wait, so John, so the pilot dies at 27. The pilot dies just a few months later. It's amazing to me that um, we don't know these guys' names the way that we know Lindbergh's name. Because in a exactly. way, it sounds like a more incredible flight. It's so Like, you look at dramatic. Lindbergh's plane, and it's... Um, a big jump up from Wright Brothers plane, but you look at the uh, the Vickers Vimy looks like you know just barely. Why would you take that across up. the ocean? Not a good idea. I wonder. Do you think the Vickers company, um, you know, that was like gratis, like because it was going to be good publicity if this plane, um, like. How did they afford it? They did. Yeah. They, they did. They gotcha. sponsored it. Gotcha. They were transitioning like war planes to become commercial planes. What was the what the, was the plane that he was in when he died a few months later? Um, that also was like a, a amphibian type of aircraft. It was the Vickers Viking, um, which was an amphibian plane that could land in water. And he was flying that to the air show um, and just, you know, oh, didn't survive this time. The news when John oh. died devastated Ted. Like they, they had a very I intense bet. partnership and a very deep bond. Uh, so he was profoundly yeah. affected, so much so that he said he would never fly as a crewman or navigator again, um, and that he would just immerse himself oh, in his engineering work. Oh, that's so yeah, he sad. lost his his interest in being a navigator uh, by losing John. He and Kathleen then did have a child named Buster. Buster shared his father's interest in flying. Feels like you, you could have maybe named him after your late partner. But Buster but, okay. might be a nickname. Ahead, maybe it is John. Okay. I didn't do that right. level of research. Buster had uh, the same interest in flying as his father, also very patriotic. He joined the Air Force during World War II. And unfortunately, on June 12th, 1944, he was killed on active duty. So oh, Ted and no. Kathleen completely devastated uh, in 1944 when they lost their only child oh. to a plane crash uh, being shot down in World War II. That. Of course, you know, that they were hardly alone. There were so many families, you know, in in various countries who were losing. The, I mean, the first Kennedy kid, didn't he, he did, die? In a, yeah. um, so, so terrible. Yeah. Uh, later than uh, a couple years later, Ted and Kathleen took their final trip to America. Ted had visited relatives there a couple times. They flew to San Francisco and Ted was quoted as saying that he was unimpressed with the advances in aviation. He said they flew unadventurously above the clouds. You couldn't even see the ocean. <laughs> he said, quote, They've taken all the fun out of flying. That original trip, that didn't sound like a lot of fun to me. <laughs> um, the uh, That that 15-hour trip, having to hold on to the controls the entire in, like, time. crazy turn. Like, everything about it sounds horrific. In snow and, and fog. you're doing math. And a plane going into it. <laughs> it's like, carry the yeah. two. Like, what is... Wait, hold on. Let me... I, I'm not lined up here. Um, so, Brown... Wait, so does Ted, does Ted live to so be So, unfortunately, he doesn't. Uh, you know, all these blows uh, really took their toll. And he uh, became very depressed and started to deteriorate. Yeah. And, unfortunately, just a couple years later, in 1948, uh, he was 62, and he took too many sleeping pills. And, you know, his wife, there's this whole story about her feeling like it was her fault because she did leave them out for him. And she knew he might take advantage of that. So debatable, but he was in ill health and died at 62. What an incredible man. Two incredible men. Yeah. So here's a, a quick side note. So in 2017, okay, hmm. we're jumping way ahead. So that's like almost, almost 100 not, years later. Yeah, exactly. There was a TV show called Antique Roadshow uh, in the UK. And Alcock's cousin's granddaughter went on the show because she had the handwritten note that he carried on the flight in the airmail bag. Unbelievable. And the note said, dear, my dear Elsie, just a hurried line before I start. This letter will travel with me in the official mail bag. The first mail to be carried over the Atlantic. Love to all your loving brother, Jack. So cool. Both men, you know, were remembered for their superior dedication to advancing the science of flight. Like well, that's what they were really the, super into. 
and the absolute balls. I mean, talk about courage. I I would have been like, I don't know. We probably just broke something on those branches back there. Should we call it a day and just <laughs> turn around? <laughs> Turn this puppy around. I'd like some yeah. more of that roast beef at the hotel. But so Alcock has one famous quote because they asked him right before the flight because they knew they were taking their lives in their hands. Like that, this was super risky. And he was quoted as saying, you might say we pilots fly to live, not live to fly. Mm. Two memorials have been created, uh, one in County Galway, Ireland, uh, near you know where they landed. There is also uh, three monuments in uh, North America. There's one in the starting point where the starting point was in Newfoundland, and cool. then another one near where they were staying at the time. So there's a few monuments around. And then, yeah, the Vickers Vimy is in the Science Museum in London, and Lord Jim. The very was, one, or it just like a similar same one? Same plane. The actual wow. plane um, cool. is in the Science Museum in London. And then Lucky Jim, the mascot that was owned by no. Alka. Uh, Lucky Jim is in the Air and Space Hall of the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. And Lucky Twinkle Jim. Toes is in the RAF Museum in Cosford. Both you can see pictures of online, the two black cats. I don't know if I would have split those two up. It feels like it's already traumatic enough that that Ted and John, you know, were were split apart by fate. <laughs> like I might have kept the cats together, but yeah, maybe then you would have had a you would have had a battle between the museums, like who gets both cats, you know. Right. But you do get to see the cats, great pictures of the cats. Now I will say when Charles Lindbergh uh did land in Paris with mm -hmm. um you know at the end of his record breaking flight in 1927, the first thing he told the crowd when he landed was, quote, Alcock and Brown showed me the way. Okay. Well, that makes me like him. A I mean, he turned out to be like a fascist and a nativist Crazy. and an anti-Semite and all that. But then again, he too lost a child. So you know, that, that's no joke. But like I said, when you look at the Lindbergh plane, it's like, yeah, I can imagine that would get sure, across. I would do that. But I'm just looking up right now what a Vickers Vimy looks like. I, it. I would in your mind? No, I would not fly, you know. I wouldn't fly uh, it across a highway. Like, exactly. Forget the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> yeah. That's a bad idea. They should have a postage stamp for these guys because they also uh, they there's a lot of firsts there. But yeah, that was the first airman. Yeah, you know, so I read this book. It's called The First Crossing by Robert Harder, and and so it it really goes into detail on this flight. Any good any good photos of these guys or yeah um, yeah great about? photos. They're probably what you would expect. You know, super clean cut looking. You know, earnest guys. Um, mm -hmm. And the book is dedicated, quote, to all the early birdmen whose total landings were one less than their takeoffs. So it was this, you know, adventurous spirit. Yeah. These guys just went out and risked everything to advance aviation. Incredible. Now, the first commercial nonstop flight started in 1928. And so they were doing this 10 years before you know, any passenger was able to actually fly across the ocean. Okay. Even in 28, I would not have been jumping no, on thank a you. Com commercial <laughs> flight across the ocean. Amazing story. I had no idea that in 1919, somebody had already crossed the Atlantic in, <laughs> in a plane. I just, I figured, I figured it was Lindbergh. So what it was, so what's his claim to fame? It's just the first solo? First solo. First uh, solo. These are two people everyone should know about. Like, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, they, you know, whoever does something, everyone knows Neil Armstrong was the first to step on the moon or whatever. So what about yeah. these two guys? These two guys were the very first people to fly across the Atlantic, not knowing if it was even possible. Well, and they'd already led. I mean, even if Incredible they had done this, ridiculous. These guys, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like the dude who like is shooting down planes before showers in the morning. And then by evening, he's in a prison camp, a <laughs> Turkish, prison, a Turkish camp. prison camp. You can't make yeah. this up. Like it yeah. really puts things in perspective. Wait, they, that was that was Jamie's John who did that, who had the long Correct. day and wound up in a Turkish camp. And he's right. the one who dies at 27. Unfortunately, he died six uh, months after he got back from flying across the Atlantic. <laughs> Was he married? He was not. He was That's not married, uh, but very good. close with his family. You know, he he was a very brash, like big personality, 
uh, really sad. I, it just seemed like a, a really interesting yeah, I mean, guy. This is a guy who is going to leave on Friday the 13th for a flight across the Atlantic. Yes. So it's not shocking he dies in a plane crash, but it's also right. sort of like just when he's had his moment of world celebrity and his family and friends and his country all pr- and just a few months later he's already he's already gone. Yeah, and he was going to open a garage. Like he wanted to be a mechanic. Like you know, he's going to retire from flying eventually. I don't know. I that feels like a guy who was never going to retire. That guy was going to not. He was going to die in a plane. Yeah, the guy with the slide rule, sure. He'll stay at home. He'll work from home. I mean, he doesn't just have the slide rule anymore. He's got the sextant. He's got the spirit right. level. Yeah, he's got know. a lot of tools. Yeah. Uh, poor Ted. Tragic life. I mean, think of what everything that he went through. Personally, yeah. physically, emotionally. It's just like, what? I would have taken the sleeping pills, too, yeah. myself, you know, by that point. Um, all right. So, Doctor, are you planning to tease episode nine? We're already up to nine. I am. I am planning to tease episode nine. This is this is a great figure in world history. It's one that we should all know about, but I didn't know enough about this person. And well, anyway, it's part of the world that we haven't hit yet. And uh, it's a culture that we haven't hit yet. And it, wow. like and, and in uh, my typical way, we're going to go back in time a bit, but uh, we're going we're gonna to learn a lot. Uh, well, fantastic. I'm glad we were able to wrap up episode eight, which was, again, a little non-traditional. In in the fact that I did present two people instead of in one. the best way. I mean, that was now, these guys were incredible. This was a pretty John and Ted's excellent adventure. Yeah, highly, <laughs> highly recommend uh, looking at photos of both John Alcock and Ted Witten and the Vimy. And the cats. Great stuff online. The, yeah, I'm going to look it up because whenever you see stuffed animals from the old days, pretty rudimentary stuffed animals. You know what I mean? Like the eyes are kind of. It really of does like, make them more related. Yeah, but that these guys are bringing stuffed animals on this. Yeah. Point. Super exciting yeah, story. Yeah. yeah, I love these guys. Awesome. Um, all right, so very good. We'll play our outro music. We'll be back next week with episode nine. Sounds good. <laughs> Storm.